uh, Scala University Press. Right. And yeah, and now he's uh, finished his uh, PhD research uh, to get a uh, feedback control loss by a factor of 10 compared with the previous implied machine learning control. His strategy has been demonstrated on numerical and experimental MIMO plans. Uh, anyway, it's not a very nice introduction, but I will leave the platform to you and we'll just start the IBM webinar. Um, no problem. Thank you very much, uh, Kai. And thank you, Disha, also for this invitation. I'm really truly honored to be part of this uh, seminar series. So, um, yes, I, I, I'm a geek on Ejo I'm a former PhD student of Professor Noaka back in Paris, in France where I got my PhD also under the supervision of Professor François Lucel. Um, and actually, uh, today I'm going to present part, part of my work uh, I did uh, on the PhD, uh, which was the developing on, uh, on a gradient enriched machine learning control for fast learning, fast self-learning of feedback controllers, exemplified on the stabilization of the Friedrich pinball and the open cavity experiments. And so uh, I would also like to, uh, to uh, to thank my co-authors, uh, Professor Marek Mordzinski for, uh, for the numerical simulation part of the Friedrich Pinball, uh, Yi Qing Li for the uh, methodological development of the gradient enriched machine learning control, and also the guidance of, uh, of my uh, friend, uh, Deng Nan, who is now also um, a fellow postdoc uh, under, under the Professor Noax team. Uh, and, um, Luc, Professor Luc Pestion. So here's the outline of my of my uh, talk. So I'll briefly introduce the the turbulence control uh, turbulence control framework and needs, and also I'm going to, uh, then I'm going to introduce the um, the machine learning methods uh, that we develop and uh, how we come up with the, the idea of gradient enriched machine learning control for fast for fast learning. Uh, then we'll exemplify this, uh, our methodology on uh, multiple input, multiple output uh, control benchmarks, Friedrich pinball. Then we'll have a, a, a demonstration on, uh, on the cavity flow. And then I'll conclude with the new opportunities and challenges we have on uh, machine learning control. Um, so first of all, I'm going to introduce broadly what is turbulence control. So uh, in general, we have some um, fluid system. So here I've put some examples that I'm going to talk later in, in, uh, adaptive work on and I'm going to present also later. But you can also imagine like any other kind of system, for example, a car or plane, where you have a set of actuators and also a set of uh, sensors. And uh, the goal of turbulence control is, is to find the mapping uh, between the actuators and the sensors in order, order, order to uh, uh, fulfill, to reach to uh, a control goal, which could be uh, drag, uh, drug reduction, lifting enhancement, mixing, uh, mixing enhancement, uh, uh, other types of engineering applications. So this relationship between the sensors and actuators is what, we, it is what we refer to as the control law which is a function. And uh, in fluid mechanics, deriving this controller is uh, particularly difficult because of the high dimensionality of the flow, the time delays between the actuation and the response, and also the complex nonlinear interactions that are in the inherent of the Navier-Stokes equations. So here I've extracted a figure from uh, Brunton in like 2015 that uh, exemplifies the large range of applications and opportunities that turbulence can bring in terms of transport, energy system, in production, uh, either safe for development or greener, safe uh, uh, energy transports, and also reducing the costs uh, of energy productions. So this is uh, why we're interested in uh, turbulence control, because any uh, improvement that you could have will have energy proportions in many fields of engineering. Um, so now we're going to um, talk about the, the methods of, of machine learning control and how to derive this controller. So this function K that, max, that maps the inputs 
uh, with the outputs of the system. Uh, and essentially how we, we, we came up with the gradient machine learning, gradient enriched machine learning control to, uh, for fast learning of, uh, of controllers. So the classical approach to, the, to derive a, um, a controller would be the, the model-based approach, uh, where the idea is to derive a simpler model of the flow uh, uh, or the plant here in, in the most general case. And we employ then this model to derive a control law, uh, a control law that satisfies a given objective. Uh, this will be um, used to control the plant. So I used to, um, I choose to, uh, to um, illustrate this model by control by Shun uh, Shulson. Um, sorry for my for my pronunciation, um, uh, which can be uh, referred as one of the pioneer of the uh, of the approach with his uh, book uh, Engineering Cybernetics appeared in 1954. Uh, however, this approach is maybe limited because the uh, model that are derived are often restricted to uh, uh, they are often restricted to um, to a given uh, uh, um, they often rely on linearization of the equations near a state of interest and their um, domain of application is often restricted. So in order to embrace the whole linearity of the flows, we uh, choose another approach, which is the machine learning approach, where the control uh, problem is reformulated as a regression problem, where we learn directly the control law from the plant. In this case, we, uh, we define a cost function that characterizes the performance of the control, and we solve a regression uh, problem, where your goal is to find a uh, k star, so the which is the minimum of the cost function j. So here we are in a uh, control optimization framework. And I choose to illustrate this approach uh, by uh, uh, this video of an eagle, which in the case uh, also managed to solve a regression problem. Actually, it's more the uh, eagle species that managed to solve a regression problem so millions of years, million years of evolution that made him into a uh, like a experiment. Uh, I mean, in an, an expert uh, bird cap capable of uh, flying and landing in the, well, in gusty conditions and uh, uh, gusty conditions. And actually, this example of uh, of this evolutionary example is not insignificant as uh, actually evolutionary strategies sorry, have been one of the first example of sets of safe learning uh, for flow control. So we know the work of Ingo Rosenberg in 1963 for uh, applying the first evolutionary strategy for the, uh, for the optimization of airfoil shapes. Uh, well, here we are on a, on a, frame, on a different framework where we are optimizing actually constants. Uh, further, further works that are related to this could be a 2008, 2001, sorry, by the work of Fukumu with, with the use of evolutionary strategies for jet mixing and the work of Bernard Ala for an experiment in the, uh, with a genetic algorithm for multi-sensor feedback, uh, for multi-sensor feedback law. In terms of control law optimization, uh, the first uh, work in flood mechanics can be attributed to Lee et al. in 1997 with the use of neural networks. Then we note in 2013 the, um, the development of genetic programming for, for flow control by the team of, by the team of Professor Noack. And in 2018, we have the first uh, application of deep reflux modeling for flow control. And uh, this genetic programming uh, in the recent years has been successfully um, uh, applied in several experiments, uh, in several uh, multiple input, multiple input experiments, uh, that, um, which motivated us 
to use it as a starting point to derive a faster uh, um, self-learning methodology. So genetic programming is based on, uh, is an evolutionary algorithm where the idea is to generate a set of uh, control laws and all evaluate them. And following the performances, they're going to be, um, uh, they're going to be, um, um, well, um, uh, how can I say that? They are going to be um, modified, uh, more or less, uh, they're going to evolve to produce better controls. Uh, so this is the general uh, idea of linear genetic programming, but for this we need first uh, an internal, internal representation of the controller where uh, it allows the modification of the controls from generation to generation. And for this, there are two main approaches. The one, uh, first one, is a tree-based genetic programming. Uh, and another one is the linear genetic programming, which is uh, one of, uh, of interest. Uh, so the idea of genetic programming is to uh, set, um, is to code, encode a function in a matrix. So here's the, encode, uh, here for example, an, an, an example of, an, of an encoding of an extraction. Uh, see here the number relates to memory registers and to operations. And so, and this particular line, for example, encodes the uh, multiplication of register one and register two and uh, stores the results in register, no, sorry, register one, register five and register one and stores the result in register two. And to have uh, an actual controller, well, we have a, this time a matrix of, uh, of instructions, uh, or matrix with different instructions uh, that is that is read linearly and uh, or sequentially, and that's why actually we, we name this method linear genetic programming. And as this matrix is read linearly, it will modify the in, the content of the register of the registers, and finally we will read at, uh, once all the registers are read, all controller in the file in the first register. For in this case, we have an example of the controller that is derived is a function of a sensor divided by uh, a constant minus p squared. This is the same thing. Um, so now I'm going to present you the actual uh, linear uh, genetic programming algorithm uh, that has been uh, introduced for fluid mechanics uh, by Julia in the 2016 Book. So here I will call the problem that we want to solve, uh, which is the minimization of uh, the cost of uh, of the cost function j. We find the uh, optimal control law, k star. Um, this is a 2D representation of the function space, which uh, is a naive representation because, of course, it's a it's a space of an infinite dimension, which is not convex and presents many minima. Um, so the algorithm starts with a broad, broad exploration of the of the search space, thanks to a Monte Carlo sampling, where the controllers are generated randomly. And in this case, the matrices that have sh that have shown they are they are um, the integers in the matrices are generated randomly, of course, in some given ranges. So this produces a population of n individu individuals, and in order to improve this population uh, to the generators. We need some operators and they call the uh, genetic operators. So the first one is the mutation operator uh, that we also refer as the exploration operation operator, where the idea is to uh, change some random uh, lines, some random uh, uh, yeah, integers in our matrix to produce uh, new controls. And uh, the idea of this uh, mutation operation is to discover new minima in the search space. Uh, another um, operation, another genetic operation is the crossover, where the idea is to take two uh, good performing individuals and to select some parts of, um, of the matrices and change them and, ex and exchange them in order to keep good structures of the controllers. And this is referred as the explorative 
uh, operator as uh, no sorry exploitative so it is the exploitation operator we're going to exploit the best individuals to get closer to the uh, to the minimum uh, and we have also another operator which is the replication operation we should come now yes uh, well, basically, the idea is to copy paste in order to have a memory of what has been learned. Uh, and this is eventually reiterated. Uh, so thanks to these operators, we create a new generation of individuals. And this is uh, reiterated uh, until the stopping criterion is reached. And through the generations, we uh, aim to reach the global minima of the space. Uh, sorry, uh, I forgot to know that in this case, the good performance here are denoted in, in, in white and the poor performance regions are denoted in black. So the power uh, uh, really of linear genetic programming is to have a population of individuals that evolve through generations. So uh, before to, uh, introducing the gradient enriched machine learning control, I'm going to uh, introduce another algorithm, the exploratory exploitative gradient method that actually inspired our gradient enriched uh, machine learning control. Um, so th uh, this is a parametric, uh, this is a parametric um, optimizer. So in this case, we are optimizing some parameters. So this is just an example in 2D. Uh, and the idea is to um, first to have an initialization step where we essentially take n plus one uh, individuals or set of parameters in our space uh, and we take it at the center of our space so n being here the dimension of our parametric space of course uh, then we have uh, as in the um, as in genetic programming an exploration uh, step or tool in this case that's carried out by latin if i keep something where the idea is to look at the spaces the furthest away from the what is already explored. And in this case, the furthest point is, of course, the, uh, the, the point on the bottom uh, left side. Uh, then we continue with an exploitation step where the idea is to have to take the best individuals and to linearly combine them to exploit the local gradient. And, uh, uh, and the idea of the syntax is to um, symmetrize and to reflect um, so, so the simplex, which is the, the n-dimensional um, um, equivalent of a triangle. So in this case here, we have the, our three base points that are closer to our minimum here. Uh, we're going to reflect the worst one uh, comparing to the uh, average of the, of, the, of the other two, and we have this new individual. And uh, as we are getting closer to the best uh, solution, to the minimum, to the global minimum, we are actually we are going to perform another simplex step, which is an expansion. Uh, and eventually, we we'll, and we have other uh, expert um, dolphin simplex operators for different uh, cases. Uh, configurations of the search space. Uh, and this algorithm then, um, I mean, th those steps are reiterated until eventually a uh, stopping criterion is reached. And you can see that the exploration step um, is distributed uh, over the whole space, whereas the exploitation steps focus on the uh, global, uh, on the, on the global minimum. So of course this is a this is a simple this is a simple example, but it shows that we can achieve a faster uh, uh, an algorithm that balances exploration and exploit uh, and the quick convergence of uh, gradient uh, methods, and this is actually what we're going to uh, include in a um, in a gradient enriched machine learning control, we are uh, we where we actually the the local gradients were not um, uh, exploited enough. So uh, so now we're going to present the gradient enriched machine learning control. No, uh, yes. 
so um, this is a, again a recalling of the optimization problem that we want to solve. This is now a 3D representation of the function space of I recall infinite dimension and convex many minima. And this is the um, global minimum that, you, that uh, we aim to reach. So the algorithm starts as a genetic programming with a Monte Carlo sampling. Uh, then we have an exploration step, this time carried out with genetic programming, uh, including both crossover and mutation. Uh, and now to uh, improve the learning, uh, with, uh, we introduce an intermediate step, which is the exploitation step with a downhill simplex, with a, which is a variant of downhill simplex for uh, infinite dimension spaces that was derived by Rowan in 1999 in his PhD thesis. And the idea is to, again, take the best individuals, I mean, the, the ones with the best performances, and to linearly combine them in uh, the subspace uh, spanned by these individuals. And uh, again, we'll reiterate uh, uh, exploration and exploitation until eventually a uh, stopping criterion is reached. Uh, and so uh, the uh, gradient edge machine learning control uh, combines both the exploration capability of genetic programming and the uh, fast learning capability of downfield uh, of gradient methods. So here's just a, a small sticker that for concluding this part. Um, so we have a multi um, we have several methods for different um, control landscapes. Uh, around these methods, we have fully explorative methods such as multi something for which is, which is kind of the optimal uh, method for non-convex spaces. Uh, whereas for X, for convex spaces, we will rely on a greater method such as Dolphin Simplex, which are, that are uh, that are purely based on exploitation, meaning that we only rely on the gradients of the space. We put uh, uh, here on the um, genetic programming that has a good exploration capability thanks to mutation, uh, but unfortunately the um, crossover is not able to um, to exploit the gradient local lo, uh, the uh, the local gradients to um, for to, to converge rapidly towards the solution. And uh, this is why and this is why we included the uh, and this is where we include the gradient enriched machine learning control that has uh, that is able that combines both exploration and exploitation. So now I'm going to illustrate the. Uh, um, this uh, our methodology on uh, on two applications. So first on the on the Fedic pinball, which is a multiple infinity output control benchmark. So the Fedic pinball consists of three cylinders, um, uh, th three, uh, three cylinders uh, in an incoming flow, mm, and the means of control of the of course the independent rotation of the three cylinders, and despite its simplicity. Uh, actually, the Fedic pinball compresses encapsulates key nonlinear key nonlinearities that are enough to uh, stimulate the Fedic pinball community, such as Steve Branton uh, with model predictive control, deep reference modeling with the team of Jean Rabo and uh, and Laurent Cordier. Uh, we have also some experiments uh, uh, led by Robert Martinez in Calgary and François Lucien. Uh, this uh, in France, and also the work of uh, Shen et al, where they um, uh, um, where, uh, they display a myriad of regimes by varying the distance between the cylinders. Um, also, uh, we are um, we choose to use the Fedic pinball as a control benchmark because of uh, this independent rotation of the cylinders. We can reproduce up to six uh, wake stabilization uh, strategies, such as both telling, best bedding, Magnus effect, low frequency forcing, high frequency forcing, and of course, peso control by uh, uh, 
by um, by a feedback of the uh, flow state. So here we have um, a visualization, visualization of the vortices T field for the steady solution. And here we have the, um, the, the natural flow at Reynolds 100, uh, at Reynolds 100. And uh, we choose the Reynolds 100 here because we are uh, beyond the two first bifurcations, the first bifurcation is the number of bifurcation responsible for the vortex shading and um, have a, another bifurcation, um, fish fork bifurcation that is responsible for the deflection of the new jet. Here we can go, we can see it's upstream. And the goal here for the control is going to be the stabilization of the flow towards the uh, steady solution. And for this, we need to define uh, a cost function uh, is going to be the distance to the symmetric steady solution. We also compute the actuation power, even though we do not include it in the uh, cost function, but it is just used to assess the performance of the control. So this is the optimization point that we want to solve. Um, first, before applying a gradient enriched machine learning control, we are going to call first a simpler search base, which is the simplest one that you can uh, achieve which is only one parameter to optimize. And for this, uh, we, have, we, are, we, uh, we are actually we are looking for the symmetric steady uh, actuation space where the front cylinder doesn't rotate and the two back cylinders rotate at the same speed in opposite directions. So for this, we don't, don't have any, uh, we don't need any uh, machine learning algorithm. We just do a parametric study. And we find that uh, a both tailing solution, that meaning that the two cylinders, the two back cylinders expose the fluid between them uh, and managed to reduce the cost function by 49%. And we can see that statistically, the uh, near jet is stabilized. This is just, this is not the mid value, this is just a, a snapshot. Um, then we have, then we explored a bigger search space, which is the, here comes, the space, uh, we authorize the rotation of, of the independent rotation of the three cylinders, which is the general general steady actuation, and for this we uh, so we have uh, perhaps three parameters to optimize, and then we'll uh, employ the uh, explorative gradient uh, no here comes no explorative gradient method, um, which managed to achieve a. Uh, for the um, cost reduction, which is of course normal because we are low, uh, we have more authority on the flow, but at higher actuation cost. And here again, we can see that the flow is, uh, we present two uh, vortex streets and there's also a uh, or symmetrization of the, uh, of the near jet. And then finally, we explore a larger search space, which is the space of feedback controllers this time. And for this, we'll need, of course, uh, a function regression uh, uh, solver. And we employed for this oh, a new uh, gradient enriched machine learning control. And here we managed to, hide, to, find, to reduce even further the cost function by 80%. And here, but, but with the lowest actuation power so far. And you can see here that the solution is similar to the one defined with expressive gradient method, except that the uh, intensity of the vortices is, is lesser, is less. Um, so here have a, a movie of the actual flow and uh, what when we look at the actuation command it, when we look at the actuation command uh, we realize that the control that is derived by GMLC is a combination between asymmetric steady forcing uh, the two back cylinders rotate at different speeds uh, and the uh, nearly constants and uh, and combines also phasor control where the front cylinder rotates at a higher speed but where the uh, we have an unsteady component which is related to the state of the flow. Uh, but uh, here uh, we did not manage to completely stabilize the flow but actually when we uh, this may be due because of the different sources of instability uh, on the flow but when we look closer to the uh, uh, ensemble average flow, we can see that the, here, the mean general state flow is close to the steady, symmetric steady target solution, except that the uh, recirculation bubble is slightly 
uh, slightly slow, uh, smaller and uh, slightly deflected downwards. And we look in, in convert, in I'll have now a, a quick uh, small common comparison between linear genetic programming and uh, GMLC. Uh, when we apply genetic programming to the same problem, we have a lesser uh, cost reduction, cost redu reduction. So here you have uh, all the individuals um, sorted um, following their um, costs uh, for each generation. And the green line denotes the best individual to generations, the evolution of the best individual to generations. And here we have uh, the same figure for, but for uh, GMLC, where the yellow ones are the individuals have been derived with, uh, with the sample steps, sample steps. Um, and we know that we not only converge, uh, so we have 80% cost reduction. And we know that we not only converge to a better solution, but also faster as even after 200, to, uh, yes, 200, uh, well, actually it's supposed to be 400. Uh, after 400 uh, evaluations, we already be, uh, we're already better than 1000 evaluations of genetic programming. So combining the conversion speed and the, um, and the cost of the final solution, we can estimate that the uh, acceleration, that we manage an acceleration by a factor of 10. So, so far, I also presented you some, uh, um, I've presented you uh, some 3D representations of infinite dimensional space, uh, search space, uh, the space of control laws. And now we here, I propose you our, a 2D representation of this of uh, the search space with a proximity map, thanks to classical multidimensional scaling. And the idea of this is, is, uh, is to, uh, to have uh, distance matrix, so a matrix that have the, that uh, includes the distance between all the control loads. So for 1000 control, we have a 1000 by 1000 matrix. And to apply a principal component analysis to derive the the main directions of the uh, of our data, and we take actually the two first rows of our decomposition, and that um, to build this proximity map, and we apply this methodology on the Euclidean space with a distance derived from a uh, from a scalar product, the canonical scalar product. We actually find the uh, actual coordinates of the points. But here, of course, we're not uh, in this case, but it is good enough to build a, a proximity map of the controllers. So uh, this is the, the proximity map from all the controllers uh, um, evaluated with all the methods. So here I color them with the different methods. Uh, here, I just want to point that uh, uh, in yellow, we have the, um, the different evaluations for the steady, uh, for the steady symmetric study and it uh, and they are nicely distributed over some kind of hip, hyper hyperbole with uh, some uh, 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 um, some kind of regular uh, spacing so we got, well, now we're going to uh, to focus more on the center of the domain where all the individuals converge so here I plotted all of the best individuals find with uh, the best methods here's the unprocessed flow and here uh, we have uh, so the best study solution this one is the best LGPC found with uh, LGPC, and here the best one uh, GM. And here the star is the best uh, GMLC control. Um, so here are the different values of the of, of the controller. So we know that the GPC solution is actually a constant solution, and uh, the, all the constant solutions are more or less in the same part of the uh, upper part of the uh, of this proximity map. Uh, so what is interesting with this proximity map, it actually reveals the, the, um, the benefit of the gradient, uh, of the gradient steps. Uh, and for this, I'm uh, going to show you the, the learning process of uh, linear genetic programming. So here are all the, all the individuals. So when I zoom, uh, we, see, we can see that uh, linear genetic programming actually explore the neighborhood here of the best uh, GMLC solution. So if we look at even closer, we can see that uh, we are indeed close to the controllers, 
to the best GNRC solution, but LGBC didn't manage to like fill the gap between those two controllers in order to reach this uh, minimum. Uh, and if we look closer at the, uh, 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 at the controllers, we can see that uh, the bottom and the top cylinders are in red and blue are all similar, but on the three, uh, there's the three controllers and the main difference relies on the front cylinder uh, on the green. And, and uh, so where LGPC didn't manage to actually find the right uh, mean value and um, amplitude for this uh, for the front cylinder, uh, GMLC managed to do it and thanks to uh, gradient, uh, thanks to the gradient step that allows him to find this solution between uh, those two other solutions. Um, so now we're going to uh, to go to another application, which is uh, an experimental demonstration of uh, GMLC on the cavity flow at VNC CNRS. Uh, so the cavity flow uh, is uh, essentially an incoming boundary layer with an interaction with the cavity. And this interaction um, uh, uh, actually um, uh, gives a self-sustained oscillation of the shear layer. So here are the parameters for the experiment. You have a, a two meters per second, around two meters per second coming velocity. Our resonance is around 10 to the four. Uh, we are in an incompressible flow. Uh, our width is 30 centimeters and our depth is five centimeters. And we have, uh, and we choose to, uh, and we vary this, uh, the, the last dimension of the cavity, the length to allow two different regimes so first, the narrow bandwidth regime with the uh, aspect ratio of 1.5, where we have one main peak in the spectrum. And the mode switching regime where, uh, with an aspect ratio of 1.65, sorry, <laughs> when you have two peaks, FA and F plus, and where uh, two peaks, two modes that actually compete. And uh, the those two um, modes, um, I mean, switch, around uh, with a very low frequency, which is around 50 seconds. So a control objective is stabilization of the shell of the shell layer. And for this, we have uh, a cost function based on the power. So we're going to look at the maximum of the spectrum. And we also have an actuation penalization term. And so this is again, all, all con uh, optimization problem to solve. So this is a picture of uh, the cavity at Vinci. So uh, our actuator here is a plasma actuator here that produces a, 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 sorry, an ionic wind that is similar to, a, a comparable to, a, a, how do you call it, um, a volumic force. Um, and our means of sensing here is a hot wire sensor downstream that's, that is used both for control and also for characterizing the flow. Uh, so before going to a feedback control, we did a, a, a steady um, a steady form steady forcing study uh, for the, for the two regimes where we um, increase the level of the um, the um, of the DBD actuator. So here in red you have the ionization threshold above uh, above which the uh, actuation is active, and we can see that with enough actuation we actually manage. To uh, to kill the first uh, the domain tone in the narrow band tooth regime, but we have also an increase of the uh, of the other uh, main mode of the flow, which is F plus. And for the mode stream regime, we have also similar results where the two peaks are, are reduced. So this uh, study uh, forcing study um, led us to two conclusions. First. One, we need to uh, add a penalization term uh, in the cost function to avoid reaching this kind of uh, solutions. And second, we need to also to uh, have a detection window of the maximum in the spectrum that includes both FA and F plus. And this, uh, this detection window is actually the, the one in, gr in green that you can see in the background. So if we apply GMLC on the, on the, on the cavity, uh, for the narrow band regime, so here's the learning curve. You can see that both exploration and exploitation have been employed for der to derive the best controller. 
uh, the best control uh, achieves 99% of the reduction of the cost function uh, with less than 1% of the actuation power, which is the uh, of the maximum that we've seen uh, on the steady actuation step. Um, so the, um, here's the spectrum of the control flow, and you can see that the main uh, peak is uh, actually reduced. Uh, but we also notice that the uh, F plus is increased, uh, has increased. So, which is uh, still acceptable. It, is, it, it remains below the main, uh, be, below the, the, the level of the main frequency. For the mode switching regime, um, so we can see that the learning is quite, it's a bit different where we have, we, we actually were uh, kind of lucky where the Monte Carlo step already managed to find a good solution that has been only um, 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 which has been slightly improved thanks to the uh, suplex steps. So this uh, GMRC solution that in K2 uh, um, reduces the cost function by 97% when again a uh, uh, a really low actuation power. Uh, so this is the actuation command actually employed for the control. And uh, here for the spectrum, we note that this time we managed to reduce both uh, both peaks in the spectrum, FA and F plus. Um, but uh, when we uh, reaching the results, we were kind of um, so we're kind of interested by the um, by the actuation command, especially for the first regime, where the actuation is uh, have a really low uh, mean value and some unsteadiness. So we're wondering if this is actually uh, in an effective control. And we have the idea to take this recording of the actuation command and to use it at an, as an open loop control for the control, uh, as an open loop control. And here's the result that we find. So. Uh, here is in blue the, the result of this control and you can see that when we do this control the peak actually grows back that shows that even this small amplitude uh, control is actually essential for the control and the actual and the feedback is a key uh, element for uh, for the reduction of the main peak in, in, in this case in the case of the uh, mode switching regime uh, the peak grew back, but uh, it's essentially the same kind of control. So we may think that in this case, K2 does not exploit any feedback for the control. Uh, but uh, we continue our analysis and uh, we uh, try the robustness of the control, of the controls learned by uh, testing each control law in the other region. So we try, so took the control of K1, tested in, in the mode switching regime, and vice versa. And this is the result that we have. For the K2, for the for K2 controlling the narrow bandwidth regime, we note that we managed to reach to reduce the main peak by the same level. And here, what is what uh, our most surprising results is that we actually also prevent the growth of the F plus uh, peak here. Uh, which also makes sense because uh, this is what uh, K2 has been trained for to control both FA and F plus. Uh, and when we when we um, and um, reversely when you use K1 to control the mode switching regime, uh, we know that we are able to control the first the main peak FA, but the, the F plus peak is not. Uh, is still uh, at the same level, which again makes sense because uh, K1 has not been trained, has not, uh, has not been learned, uh, didn't learn to control this peak. Uh, once we get those results, we did again the same open loop uh, uh, test that we did uh, before. So here showing blue. And here, what a surprise when we use it on the K2 uh, controlling uh, as an open loop control. The, the narrow band region, we note that the peak grows back. That meaning that K2 also relies on feedback control as an F1. So this shows that gradient enriched machine learning control 
uh, is able to learn both robust and, and effective feedback controllers. And that feedback is, uh, uh, is essential here for the stabilization of, of, the, of the gap. So before ending this, this part, I'm going to present you uh, another uh, uh, new visualization technique of, uh, of controllers based on clustering. So the idea is to have a visual representation of the controllers that we've learned to add the human interpretability of the machine learning solutions. So here you have the control cavity with an actuation command. We have the velocity, we build a feature vector. This feature vector is actually the one that is used to, uh, as an input for the controller. It, uh, it includes, of course, the velocity and the velocity delayed with some time delays. Um, we use some clustering to uh, extract the representative states of the uh, um, of the flow. Uh, we build a transition matrix. We project all this data on a proximity map to build a network model, which is actually a reconstruction of the phase space. And in, in this phase space, um, and uh, uh, yeah, all the phase space. And this is, uh, so we apply it on different, uh, uh, on the different cases. And this is maybe the most interesting one for the control of the narrow bandwidth regime with, uh, with K1, with the, uh, first controller. Um, and we denote here there are two cycles, one big and one small, that can be interpreted as limit cycles in the phase space. And here, uh, another uh, another century that is sentient, which can be interpreted as the fixed point of, uh, uh, of a phase space. Um, so here, the different um, bars that you can see is actually the actuation level, uh, the mean actuation level uh, F, um, for each one of, of these centroids. And uh, red means that we are positive regarding to the mean and blue we are negative in regards to the, to the mean value of the actuation. And uh, we note that the, um, the actuation actually divides the space space in two uh, regions which is kind of the, the signature of a phasor control. And we note also that as we will go from the outer limit cycle to the inner limit cycle, the, the, the actuation sign changes, which can be interpreted, interpreted as, uh, as a phase difference due to the frequency change in the control. Uh, yeah, so, yes, so this, uh, what we achieved on the uh, on the stabilization of the uh, on the cavity flow, and if you want to have more information, you can look at our uh, 2020 uh, paper uh, submitted to GFN that is in revision, and you can find on archive. Uh, so before concluding, uh, now I wanted to talk about the new opportunities and challenges uh, by lever uh, that is offered to us by leveraging the technologic technological advancements. Uh, that uh, that uh, allows us to develop distributed input, distributed output control. Uh, so so far, I presented to, to you uh, the control of a, a CISO system, single input, single output system with the cavity flow, where we map a single a, uh, a signal to command. Also, the, we are presented to a control of a Linux system, multiple and multiple outputs where we uh, learned a mapping between a vector and a vector. But now, um, the te technolo technological developments uh, allowed us to, uh, to build a more reliable, more powerful, and more robust controllers, and also more cheap controllers and actuators. Uh, for example, here we have uh, the example of the small hot jet acoustic rig at NASA with 100 microphones for also the, um, uh, the work by uh, the team of uh, Professor Farouk and uh, collaborators with uh, Fernando Zigunov where they have um, distributed act, uh, active controls um, at the back of a slanted body with in this case of 59 uh, mini jets that as they call Jexels, yes. And then also uh, even have the uh, automotive uh, in, um, industry that envisions new uh, 
con um, new controllers with this uh, concept curve of the uh, vision avatar with 30 passive uh, vortex gener generators on the back of the, of the curve. Um, so uh, we have now the, the technique, um, the possibility to develop um, to, uh, to develop uh, controllers, including uh, of the order of 100 actuators and sensors, which we know as distributed input, distributed output, output control. But the next met methodological advent, uh, next methodological challenge that comes with it is to learning, uh, is to learn uh, a controllers uh, that maps a distribution to another distribution, where the um, uh, special uh, spatial uh, information of the sensors and actuators is essential for the uh, for the control. And for this, we have uh, our experiment at HNT, which is a, a small scheme, which is backward fencing ramp, including uh, our array of actuators and sensors. Uh, in this case, we have um, uh, thirty. Uh, multimodal control units with allows three modes of actuation. Um, one of where uh, the the word, um, this control unit is retracted under the uh, uh, and the surface is smooth. And we have a, a passive mode. We can control the height of the uh, of the control units, and we have an active mode. We have a microjet at the at the back of the uh, voltage generator. The, uh, those microjets allows both optimization of uh, parameter of um, parametric optimization for shape optimization and also uh, feedback control uh, the means of sensing here have 56 pressure uh, pressure taps and our goal for this is to uh, is the drug production uh, and for this we have uh, two terms in the cost function one based on the pressure recovery another based on the uh, on uh, an actuation uh, penalization term so this is a picture of the actual experiment uh, that has been uh, developed here by uh, uh, my colleague, Dr. Sanchini. And we envision to uh, use this, uh, to, uh, to deploy the, the smart skin in different uh, vehicles, such as car instruments, in order to uh, uh, control separation and to have greener and safer uh, transports. Um, so here, here I have a, a, a smoke visualization of the earth force flow for the uh, for the small skin. You can see the separation and the uh, and um, steadiness of the flow. Uh, here are the results of control of the small skin. The um, here, uh, we have a PIV of the uncontrolled flow. We can note the recirculation bubble and the separation. And here have a, another PAV of the control flow with steady actuation. We will note that the, um, the, um, the full retouchment of the flow. We also applied, of course, our GMLC algorithm to the uh, to the configuration, uh, and we, where we uh, and, and this is the main result that we have. Um, so, oh, sorry, each one of this. Um, um, we, we present here the equivalent duty cycle of the best laws, 100% uh, meaning with a constant actuation and zero have no actuation at all. And we show that uh, actually gradient, uh, that GMLC is able to learn a special distribution of control laws. And we believe that is due to, uh, thanks to the gradient uh, steps that are unable to smooth and to select the good controllers by a linear combination uh, of the best controllers. Uh, so with this, I arrive to the end of my talk. So let me summarize what I've been talking, uh, what I've been presenting. So we develop a gradient enriched machine learning control for fast learning of feedback controllers, combining explorative power of genetic programming in fast convergence of gradient mess methods. Uh, we applied the stabilization of the fluidic pin bot at Reynolds 100. We derived a uh, solution that combines fuzzle control and bot tailing, which achieved 80% of, of the cost reduction. Um, compared to LGPC, uh, GMLC achieved uh, a factor 10 acceleration. 
and with the proximity map, uh, um, we've highlighted the benefit of graphing methods for better solutions. We also applied it to the stabilization of the open cavity flow in two different regimes. We showed that the, the, the controls that we learned are robust with a change of regime. And we especially uh, denoted that the, the laws that we've learned uh, relies on feedback for an efficient control. Uh, so I didn't present uh, the results, but uh, we of course tried also LGPC algorithm on the, on the stabilization cavity flow. And we showed that the, uh, again, uh, a GMLC outperforms LGPC in terms of uh, speed and uh, performance. We also develop a cluster-based uh, cluster um, cluster control visualization that uh, has been uh, developed to aid the human interoperability of machine learning solutions and reveals a phase of control strategy for the stabilization of the first region. Uh, so I also introduce the smart skin drug reduction experiment, which includes distributed input distributed output, uh, output um, control that combines both, act, both uh, um, feedback control and shape optimization. Uh, and so far, when applied uh, with the JMLC, we managed to uh, um, do gradient steps, uh, were able to derive a structured solution uh, for, the, for the pressure recovery uh, on the smart skin. Uh, but there are much more to come. We have, for example, uh, the um, our future world will be focused on the combination of uh, learning controllers, uh, co uh, of, of the optimization of feedback controllers and uh, shape optimization. Uh, we'll also um, to develop a proper algorithm for uh, learning uh, uh, feedback controllers for DIDO distributed and pre-distributed output experiments, cover automatic visualization of the, of, uh, of the learning solutions, and for also many more experiments to, uh, to apply those new methods. So stay tuned and uh, thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to, uh, to answer them. And if nothing comes to mind, you can of course send me an email and uh, you can also visit uh, uh, my GitHub or you can uh, have the you can find the GMLC uh, uh, code that we developed. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Massad, for this excellent talk. Yeah, your method is definitely practical importance. So uh, if anyone has any questions, you can just open your mic or you can left your question in the chat. Uh, as you may notice, the talk is a little bit long, so we'll like make the question section short. Sorry about that. Maybe I can start it. So, um, um, so thanks, Kai. Like, this is very nice, like talks. So, I have many three major questions. So, two, like you know, on the question, like um, you have in the slides, and um, one maybe like a little bit of visioning in the future. The first one, you use a word. I I, I believe in slide twenty four or something about a robust, robust control, like a robust feedback control. Yes. Um, so that referring to that like uh, the noise that you actually incorporated the noise directly into like you know the feedback like you no know, the, the 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 observer right uh by no uh, by uh not exactly by robustness i meant that uh, the, where, when we apply one control law to another uh, for learn from one regime to the other regime the performance remains uh, that's what essentially uh, what i meant by robustness Okay, that's uh, that's actually actually when, when you write uh, when you talk about a ping ball, I already like, think about the robustness like in the keywords like uh, with, which changing Reynolds number, like you know whether the like a control law still holds all the thing. So it's like more like a generalization to like you know this because I, I just want to comment on that reinforcement in at least some of my my training is a notorious in terms of, like a transfer like you know knowledge between like you know different like you know regimes so. But then, like you know, in, in terms of noise, like for yes. the instrument, so applying some common filter or directly putting into like an you know, objective function, like you know, when you when you do the like you know evaluation. Um, so, actually, uh, concerning the robustness of the control, we've um, uh, we've recently published a paper. Uh, uh, of color 
collaborators in Madrid, uh, uh, Andre, Andre Ayenero and uh, Stefano Dischetti, uh, and uh, of course, of course, author Rodrigo Castellano, um, where the for comparison of reinforcement learning and uh, linear genetic programming uh, with different uh, on the control of the of a cylinder with two jets, uh, where we actually included the noise to test the robustness of the control. And it appears that uh, both, uh, both approaches, reinforcement learning and the genetic programming, uh, are able to, uh, to, re to remain, to keep their performances with the addition of noise. And I believe we have 1%, 2%, and 5% uh, noise uh, introduction in the, in the control. I see. Uh, I mean, well, in terms of like noise, like, you know, in experimental, we can also apply some common future before like to do the analysis, right? So, okay. So uh, another key question I want to, um, you to have maybe enlighten me or clarify is like in slide 30. Yes. So which you start mentioning like this new concept of distributed into a distributed output. So, yes. um, so I see like uh, in the stream wise, like in the like you know, the bottom right, um, it seems to me that like, you know, basically like you know, the downstream of like, you know, the like you know, actuator does not make yeah. like you know, strong effect, which to some degree makes sense because probably like a most significant effect will be close to the separation point that push that exactly. line. Like, you know, yes. Exactly. And so, oh, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, sorry. And also, uh, um, also for this control, we're also penalizing the, the actuation power. So indeed, as you said, the, the, the control is mainly focused on the region of interest and, and the penalization term was going, uh, is going more or less to eliminate the, 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 the other roles of control where the performance may not, uh, well, uh, the, what the, the, the control achieve or the performance um, uh, is not uh, may not in, in, well the actuation <laughs> the actuation of this uh, rules may not improve the performance yeah. oh, okay uh, and, just... and, and, and and it depends also on the operating condition so if you go to lower velocities suddenly all the all the actuators are operating and they're op operating in feedback mode so as they are fluctuating so this is one snapshot for a high velocity i think this was 10 meters per second but if you if if, if you change the velocity you can get other results I, I think I have read that like in one of the like, you know, papers sent to POF, I think it haven't published, but I, 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 happy, I, I was very too lucky to review that like in a, like, you know, the Ahmad, like, you know, the, 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 I think like in your guys, like a, a rectangle shape with also like, you know, the, 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 this like, you know, yeah. So, but like my follow-up question on that is that, so there will be like, you know, um, on the order of hundred or even tens of sensors or distribute this uh, like you know the 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 the, the, the like you know actuators. Um, yes. But still, that's not like a like you know nothing compared to the dimensionality of like a flute, right? So um, there's also like a spot sensing, like you know where to put the sensors, or put the, like a location of the, like you know. Um, and I see in the and all and at the end of your talk, you mentioned just like a combination of like a control and a shape optimization. Yes. My question is like whether there's some word and or some thought already in terms of where to put sensors, like or put actuators, like you know, with the domain knowledge we have to begin with. Uh, yes, but um, this is of course a a, a large. Um, Problem that uh, mm, mm, let me, <clears throat> that needs its proper so, study. Um, <laughs> for, for for the jet, we do open loop control. So we just measure something like uh, sixty four velocities, so that we know the jet profile, and we uh, we, we have no feedback in our first implementation for the jet. Yeah. So I guess like you know, even back to like a pinball, like they have a nine point nine velocity like measure point, 
right? Yes. May, may I ask for a clarification? How do you choose that nine point? Or just we pick like you know, uniformly? Uh, yes, so in this case, they were chosen uniformly. So in this case, we're, we're, uh, we're kind of, uh, um, yeah, for us numerical simulations, we're kind of um, uh, lucky to put as many sensors as we put. And we are kind of using, uh, doing the, the reverse the idea where we uh, look at the GMLCT solutions, the, the solutions that have been generated and look which one actually are the ones that are uh, interesting. We use this algorithm for uh, sensor optimization in a sense. Yeah. Um, I see. Yes. I mean, um, yeah. As you read it, point, it's a big question, right? I don't think it's an end question. Like, this, like if some people get sold that, they're probably going to end up with a very nice result. Um, I don't know whether other people have like questions, but I do have one more question for that. I can maybe leave like if other people have questions. Uh, maybe I should continue ask Kai. <laughs> no, no problem for me. Okay, so I, I have one, one more like, you know, like, uh, like you know, a soft uh, question, like uh, starting with like, you know, the eagle that like, you know, they're flying like a, at least in that state is like a, in a stay trying to keep in a reference, like, you know, uh, uh, like in, in a control reference, like uh, trying to keep in that space, keep in that like velocity, like, you know, even there's some like, you know, gust or some like, you know, external things. Um, so yes. in these type of like uh, uh, control that from my perspective, like uh, defining an objective, uh, objective function, like, you know, is relatively like, you know, um, like obvious or more, not obvious, so like, you know, more like, you know, uh, like, you know, introductory, uh, intuitive. So like, you know, say like, you know, what, the, the difference between uh, like, you know, your current state and the reference state, all the things. Okay. However, um, we see in nature that for example, for bird, they can do a like, quick, like, you know, rotating, they can dive, they can do like this transient move, like in the unsteady condition. Uh, yes. What do you see the like you know potential of the current like you know control methodology that apply into these um, like you know agile motion in the unsteady flow condition? So again, this is an open open end question. Um, I, I just want to have like you know, some some thought from you guys. Yes. Well, well um, I think we're moving to, towards this kind of. Uh, uh, well, uh, this kind of, uh, uh, not solutions, but uh, yeah, well, let's say uh, expert, uh, um, expert uh, uh, animals, or uh, they can fly and study solutions. But uh, as you said, uh, the, they benefit from like, uh, well, uh, uh, a continuous surface, a se sensing surface where it, he sort of, uh, he, uh, the eagle senses the uh, the flow with his whole body, and for so uh, we're more or less going in this direction with this distributed into distributed output control. With that, uh, kind of want to have a, a well, a clear uh, sensing of the whole, of the whole surrounding. Um, but this, of course, we're going to have to uh, uh, for the steps to be taken in order to to, to reach that level of practice. Even though with drones, we are we are getting uh, closer to uh, to, uh, to that kind of solution. Where the, the main problem for now seems to be, uh, of course, the sensing and the, and the prediction of the of the steadiness of the flow to uh, to be able to adapt. Yeah. Thank you. This one, yeah, that's this. Is what comes to mind? <laughs> yeah. Again, this is like also a question that I have been asked. Thinking it's not never like you know ending, but I think there will be sure. like you know, even more talk like with a couple of teas. Like we can brainstorm even more. So, of course. Thank you. Thank you for your question. I think Kai, you are muted. So. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. 
So uh, thanks for everyone for uh, participating in this IBM talk. Uh, thanks Dr. Mossad for giving this uh, impressive talk here. So we are running out of time, but you can always ask questions to Dr. Mossad through emails and uh, even WeChat. So uh, let's end today's talk and we'll see you next week. Thank you again. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.